Inu Elam Mokzwait. Welcome, everyone. This is uh, TRC 57 Speaker Series, our fourth season. This uh, series for our speakers is uh, part of Nanaimo Ladies Smith Public School's efforts to implement TRC 57, Call to Action 57. And we're uh, very pleased to do this in conjunction with the Vancouver Island Regional Libraries, our, uh, our co-sponsor, and of course our UBC Press, who's uh, been our sponsor since the very start of this. They've uh, connected us to all of the authors that we've had at the uh, opportunity to host over the last three years and this into our fourth season. I'm here co-hosting with my great friend, uh, Stephanie Johnson, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and our our other co-host uh, is busy today, Lawrence uh, Mitchell. Some cotton would usually be here to open us, open our house and uh, ask our ancestors to join us and wrap around us. Uh, he's not able to join us today. So on his behalf, I'm just going to uh, do that. I'll, uh, I'll uh, open with uh, a recognition that we're on this territory of the Hukkamitnam speaking peoples hosting here on the west coast of what is now called Canada. And uh, Lawrence has taught us that uh, this beautiful land uh, looks after us. It uh, gifts us with all of the things that we need to be healthy and happy and strong, including language and uh, culture, uh, food. The ancestors here on this on these territories have looked after this land since time immemorial and continue to do so. So we ask those ancestors to wrap around us. And we look forward to our conversation today with our guest. And hopefully that words that we share in this meeting today go out and uh, help people on their journeys and give them medicine as they walk together. It's our great pleasure to uh, welcome Heather Menzies uh, as our guest this today. Uh, Heather's an award-winning author, activist, adjunct research professor at the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies at Carleton University. In 2013, she was appointed to the Order of Canada for her contributions to public discourse. And most recently, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, collaborated with Anishinaabeg at Stony Point to produce her book, Our Long Struggle for Home, the Ipper Wash Story. She's won book awards, uh, magazine awards. Two of her books appeared in the Globe and Mail, Top 100 Books of the Year. Holy cow, Heather. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, uh, Heather li lives on the unceded Stenemoch territory in British Columbia, so very close by right here at home. And so we are so pleased to welcome Heather and talk a little bit about, and you can see this book in uh, Stephanie's background and mine, uh, Meeting My Treaty Kin, A Journey Towards Reconciliation. Heather, meet no Elam. The floor is yours. Hi, Sapka, Siam, Stephanie. And Ted, thank you for so generously creating this welcoming space for me to share what I've learned over the last five years. And thank you, all of you on the other side of the screen, for joining us in this sharing that is geographically grounded. As Ted said, I'm on Gabriola Island, the beautiful, ancestral, unceded territory of the Snunimok people. And I hope that if their spirits are present, and I always often feel them present, I hope that what I have to say today might be pleasing to their ears, to their hearts, to their spirits. Like many people I know, I was kind of stalled in the starting gate of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I'd bought the t-shirt, showed up at meetings, protests. I participated in land acknowledgements. I'd even led some myself. But they get a bit repetitive. Sort of like, and now what? I hadn't even been on a First Nations reserve. It had never been my destination. Until one day in 2018, when I headed to the Stony Point Reserve in Southwest Ontario. I want to read a little bit of something from the book. November 2018. On a cool gray day in late autumn, I stood outside the former Ipawash Army barracks where Cully George Mandica has lived since 1995, the year her brother Dudley was shot 
by the Ontario Provincial Police. There were 200 years of social, cultural, and political alienation between the woman on the other side of the door and me. Yet somehow, according to Indigenous ways of thinking, about which I was starting to learn, this woman and I were related, as was Dudley, through a treaty. We were even treaty kin. I knocked on the door, my mouth dry, my heart beating in my chest. I waited, my eyes on the small square window set in the faded wooden door. The curtain moved. I stood there waiting, feeling conspicuous as a pickup truck drove by on the road just beyond where I stood, slowing down as it passed. Someone had noticed me. I felt self-conscious, clearly a white person, Shogunosh, on this remnant of ancient Nishnabi territory. I continued to stand there, not wanting to knock again, but not wanting to give up either. The door opened a few inches. In the darkness of the opening, I saw a short woman, brown skin, dark brown eyes, chin length gray hair. Yes, she said, her voice hard. I told her my name. I knew it was pretty late, I said, but I'd come to offer her my condolences at the death of her brother. She looked at me hard. I held her gaze. Brown eyes on blue, blue eyes on brown. She stepped back, pulled open the door. Come in, she said. I went there that day, knocked on the door because I had discovered that an 1827 treaty had legitimized my great, great, great grandparents settling in Southwest Ontario, then Nishnabi territory in 1832. That same treaty had set aside large chunks of Nishnabi territory for the exclusive use of the Nishnabi in perpetuity. But in 1942, the federal government invoked the War Measures Act to appropriate the entire reserve and turn it into an army training camp called Ibawash. After the war, instead of giving the land back as they verbally promised, they turned Ibawash into a cadet training camp and carried on through all the protests, all the letter writing, all the petitions. And even when in 1993, the elders led the way home and they started setting up their own encampments near the rifle ranges that were still going. Two years later, the OPP moved in and Dudley George was shot. I felt implicated in this because I'd also been learning about treaties from an Indigenous point of view. They're all about relationships and the sharing of land and responsibility for maintaining that treaty relationship is passed down from generation to generation. That would be me, I thought. And that's what caused me to go. And here I'd like to little sort of, sort of by way of taking you along with me, I've got a bit of a slideshow and if Stephanie, if you could bring on um, the first slide is just shows the title of the book, but the second slide shows um, two row wampum belt, a tattered old one uh, that I've superimposed on a map of the, <clears throat> of the, um, um, of the Ipawash army camp showing some somewhat showing the the rifle ranges and mortar ranges and all this sort of thing. Um, I wanted just to start here because even though the Turo Wampum Bill isn't very well known and doesn't tend to be associated with a lot of the discussion about treaties in the west of Canada, the Anishinaabe legal scholar John Burroughs says that all of these early Wampum Bills related to the earliest of the treaties between the the um, Indigenous people on the East Coast and the new European new newcomers set the stage. And this one is central because it shows the two rows of purple shells. One is, a, is to indicate a birch bark canoe filled with Indigenous people and all their customs, traditions, and laws. And then the other is a, a sailing ship representing the European newcomers and all their traditions. And, and customs and laws, going down the river of life together, sharing space, mutually respecting each other's autonomy and sovereignty. 
So I just wanted to sort of set that out there. The next slide, uh, Steph, please. Now here's a bit of a symbol of the, 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 the indigenous customs and, and sovereignty. Next slide. This is the next slide shows actually the shows the first sign that that I found when I when I came to what was still Iberwash, um, though nominally returned to the Anishinaabe people as Stony Point. Here was a sign that showed all the destruction of colonialism in this particular spot. All the debris, they're still cleaning up the unexploded mortar shells, grenades, this sort of thing. Next slide shows. Um, the council house that um, when they when the elders led the way home to Stony Point in 1993, all the people who came with them got together and they created this building where they could have they could re resume their self governance traditions and their their other ceremonies. Next slide shows this in the background and in the fore closer to the foreground is the tree that they planted in 1993 as a seedling as part of a, a peace honoring, a burying of the hatchet ceremony that they held. They were committing themselves to being nonviolent. There were going to be no, no guns. It was all going to be peaceful. Next slide shows one of the barracks that is still there. And both Cully and one of the other people who became co-authors of the book, Our Long Struggle for Home, are still living in these barracks. Uh, the next slide shows the interior of Cully's barracks. And this is what I walked into that day when she opened the door. Um, this is a large living space, kitchen, dining room, living room, all combined. And she's working on a bear paw quilt. Next slide is a close up of her. And then the next slide, again, I'm wanting to introduce the main people I, I worked with. Marcia Simon, um, close to my age in her seventies. And then the next slide shows herself and her son, Kevin, on the left. And he was the fourth of the, of the co-authors. And the next slide shows a, a picture of him smiling away at me. He was, uh, uh, it meant so much to them to make this story happen. And so the story that happened is the next slide. No, it's not. We've got the, we want to introduce the next person who is Bonnie. Um, Bonnie Brissett was the oldest. She was in her mid eighties when I met her and obviously a little bit older now. Um, and the final slide um, is the, the cover of the book itself, which came out um, two years ago, 2022. And it was with the collective authorship of these four people. So now we are getting there, back to picking up the thread. Um, and um, so I was there, one in person introduced me to another, and next thing I knew, there sort of was like a meeting going on. And somebody said, you know, we've been hoping someone with journalistic skills might show up and help us tell our story. And that's how I became their writing assistant for our long struggle for home. At the time, I just thought, oh, how great. It didn't occur to me how inappropriate it was for me, a white person, to be working on helping these people with this, to tell a broken treaty story behind the shooting death of Dudley George. At the time, I was just focused on, oh my God, I'm in. If not treaty kin, then treaty kin in training or treaty ally in training. And furthermore, ha ha ha, I can leave all this messy baggage around colonialism parked at the door. Ha ah! <laughs> no, 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 no. That baggage came with me. The power dynamic of colonialism and white superiority was deeply ingrained in how I thought, how I talked, how I walked into a room. One day recording a session with Marcia Simon, she was talking about daily life in 1993 when they were back on, at Stony Point and sharing food and doing the council fire. And I said, kind of affirmingly, you were carrying on being traditional. And she just snorted. She said, it wasn't being traditional. We were just being, just being normal, being human. And I realized, yeah, I put a label on. I put her into an historical box. And I boxed out the fullness of her humanity. 
Another time was a very long recording session because she was telling me, same woman, Marcia Simon, she was telling me about the day that Dudley was killed and her son, Kevin, was shot at. It was a very hard recording and it was a fair amount of crying on both our parts. And then at the end, she was sort of talking about now. And she said, there's my Kevin, still in a barracks, and there's Cully. Because the elders had said, you have to stay there until the land is officially put back in the jurisdiction of the Anishinaabe or the federal government will never do it. So there they are, she said. And now Kevin, who was 16 in 1993, is now in his 40s. She was sort of lamenting. And he's still there carrying on. And so I said, the occupation. Said, and again, she started to scoff. She said, no, it wasn't an occupation. You think of occupation, go and occupy something, and then you go home. We were home. This is our home. And I realized, and you know, all through that action from 1993 to 95, the media coverage always used the word occupation because it helped kind of keep normalizing the, basically the colonial status quo. Start calling it homeland, reclaiming your homeland. And the contradictions begin to surface. The legacy of the treaties and the unmet, the broken promises around that begin to surface. But it was, it was so insidious, this power dynamic. I was talking about colonialism and white superiority. In the book, I liken it to like a, a gravitational force field. It was that subtle, too, and that almost pre-conscious. I got to just be pulled ineluctably into kind of assuming that I was the one in the know. I knew how to frame things. I knew how to interpret things, how to label things. I also realized it was up to me to break out of that. And I did it by paying attention. By caring enough about these people I was working with to notice the you know, tightening of the lips or the silence that signaled a withholding of trust that I was really listening, really hearing and heeding what they had to say. It was a bit of kind of push-pull, the push of my determination to disrupt my unconsciously colonial thinking. And then the pull of these relationships that I was starting to form with these people as I spent more and more time with them in their homes. And I think that made a difference too, because I was out of the comfort zone of my familiar. And always, I was the only white person in the room. I remember being at Bonnie Brissett's home for the first time. And I noticed this, there was this birch bark sticker log with red ribbons around it, leaning up against the door, leaning up against the wall, just behind the front door. I mean, I kind of skittered away from it, afraid, afraid to look at it, really. Because instantly it communicated to me the enormity of all I did not know and did not understand. But I had to just sit there with that discomfort of not knowing, not understanding. And sort of, as they say, breathe through the sense of powerlessness of not knowing until I could let myself begin to understand and know, perhaps in new ways. One of the things I quickly learned is that the mothers, certainly Bonnie's mother, Marcia's mother, Kali's mother, the parents of most of these people, they were forced to attend the local residential school, Mount Elgin, run by the United Church of Canada. One of the things that I did sort of on my own as part of my own personal journey was reached out to the local United Church which had a right relations group trying to do their own work towards reconciliation. And there was this one Sunday when I actually was heading, I'd been invited to Bonnie's place for supper. But I, that morning I went to that church and I met with the people in the right relations group. 
And they told me about that they would had this exhibit of photographs of the children who'd gone to Mount Elgin Residential School. Oh, I said, um, well, you know, are those photos still around? I said, you know, I thought Bonnie would be really interested. So there I was at Bonnie's place later, peeling potatoes and just, you know, waiting for the right moment. And then I, I just sort of mentioned about this exhibit and, and, and she just, she stopped what she was doing. I heard about that, she said. I want copies of those. I'll pay for them. And it was just like the fierceness of her reaction just sort of jolted me. I thought she'd be interested, but no, 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 this was way beyond that. And of course, like, news of the unmarked graves at Camden came as a surprise to people like me, but not to people like Bonnie. She knew about all the children who never came home and maybe disappeared into unmarked graves. When I went back to my motel that night, I could tell I was feeling really troubled. So I lit a candle and I just sort of sat with that. I want to read you a bit of that. Even though I'd read about all these children's deaths, the reality of them, as lived lives and part of an indivisible webwork of lived lives had remained remote until now. I stared into the candle flame, aching at that remoteness, aware too that in a way it echoed the indifference of those school officials who would do such things. Leaning toward the candle flame, I sat with that indifference and the racism in its shadow. I sat too with what Bonnie had said, the emotion of her response bursting in on me, her fierce desire to get copies of those photos. I sat there as the candle burned lower, feeling that urgency, identifying with it, making a connection. I was starting to make Bonnie's reality part of my reality, sharing it. I kept gazing at the candle flame as it flickered and held steady, flickered again and steadied itself. The boxes in my head had kept us at a distance, I realized. That jolt had been a sign of it. The difference in our perspectives, our sense of reality and what was important. But the sadness, if I dwelt on it too, also signaled a crack. Every crack was helping me break out of my inner boxes, opening the space between us, filling it with empathy and the capacity for love. And as that empathy and love grew, my defensiveness, my need to keep proving myself kind of fell away. I no longer felt the need to feel responsible for keeping the conversation going. I could just be taking in whatever was being said, including the silences, listening to the silences. And that's when the breakthrough started to happen. We've got a last thing I wanna read and this is um, at Bonnie's place. Um, her husband, Fred, joined us for this recording. This is about a year into my visits and getting to know these people. Um, Fred, Bonnie's husband, was a language speaker and a knowledge, a language speaker and a knowledge keeper. And it was quite wonderful. We, we sat there and they talked about what daily life was like on the reserve before the army trucks came in 1942. And eventually they get around to telling me also about how they learned medicines, many medicines from the animals. So Fred was telling me about this particular root of a water reed that the um, muskrats use. And then he, he started to tell me about how the birds come to the birch trees for the sap from, from the buds in the very, very early spring. You know, read here. Fred leaned forward and looked out the window at the old birch trees standing on one side of the front yard. 
He watches for the birds every spring, he said, coming to drink the sap water from the opening buds. They come right in that old birch tree, he said. That's why they're up there getting that medicine. He turned and smiled at me. And in that instant, when our eyes met, something happened. It could have been how Fred had tilted his head so he could look out the window, connecting with a spot high up in that beautiful old birch tree where the birds return every spring. Or it could have been the joy that seemed to radiate off his face as he evoked this seasonal ritual, this moment of kinship with a bird seeking the sap's healing power after having endured a long winter too. A bird sharing its knowledge of this with human beings. It could also have been the fact that he was sharing this with me, letting me in on this and all it meant to him. It was as though he was inviting me in, not, in, not just into this circle of shared knowledge, but into a kinship circle of sharing that included muskrats and birds too. I felt as though I had crossed a bridge, as though I had caught a glimpse of the other shells on the wampum belt. Not just the purple shells representing the Anishinaabe canoes going their way separate from the white people's sailing ships, but the white shells in which these purple lines are embedded, the cosmos that holds them. I got a sense of what it was like to be stitched into that bed of white shells, that cosmos. Connected to the trees, the birds, and the, and the medicine that they share. This shift, it, it was like I was no longer learning about an Indigenous way of being. It was like I had been invited to join it. I'd been invited into it as a participant. And I began to get just the beginning of a sense of what it might be like to live like that, embedded in a webwork of relationships with the more than human as well as other human beings, mutually respectful, interdependent, mutually sustaining. And as that breakthrough started to happen, these breakthroughs in my thinking started to happen, that's when I really began to grasp the challenge of reconciliation. Because it's not just up here at the level of crown and sovereign nations working things out and reconciling, but it's down here at the level of how we live our lives every day and all the institutions through which and in which we work. It's a, the challenge is a reconciliation of different realities. And with that, different ways of thinking, doing, and being. And being open to that so that we can do that reconciliation. Which is why I realize it's so important that I, as a settler, took on, challenged my unconsciously colonial thinking. I had to get rid of what was blocking my ability to really appreciate and get this other way of thinking and being. So you change the thinking and you can change the relationship from one that's more colonial to one that's more treaty based on equality and mutualism. And as we start to move in that direction, so we can together begin to change how we do everything from an institutional level to public policy. I want to end with a couple of examples that the kind of maybe show you and can share the excitement actually I feel at how my thinking has changed and opened up. As I move from sort of thinking in terms of abstract boxes to thinking more in relational terms. One example is, uh, let's take it in the cultural area because this here's this wonderful series sponsored by school board and library. So in, in the cultural sector where there's schools and universities, libraries and museums. Um, 
one of Bonnie Brissett's uh, granddaughters, I spent a lot of time with because often when I'd be visiting, she'd drop in. And then we, we got to talking because she had a short, a three month contract with a prestigious museum and archive. They wanted her to record elders' stories so that they could add these to their holdings. And one of the things she told me as she as the trust began to develop and she was confiding in me, she said, you know, it's so hard with this just limited amount of time I've got because she spent so much time just relationship building with these elders um, so that they will entrust them, to entrust her with the stories that they've been trusted to carry forward from one generation to the next. And so there's not the, the, the three month contract didn't really allow for that. Uh, so that was a, that was something she was talking about. But then towards another visit, she it was coming towards the end and she was ready to be sort of turning over these stories. But she said, I want to, I feel as though I should also say that every time the stories are used, they should bring in an elder who can share those stories. And then this, this light bulb went off in my head. It was all like, well, yeah, no longer thinking of holdings in as a noun but thinking of holdings as a verb and the relationships of holding, holding stories and being held by stories. A similar kind of shift in thinking has and it resulted in similar kind of shifts in, in and now how I think about land and the environment. Um, and here the example, I, I found myself more fully appreciating and understanding the environmental assessment that the Slel Wotooth uh, nation had done when there was going to be this expansion of the Trans Mountain pipeline and tanker um, that was going to seriously impact the Bur Vancouver's Burrard Inland, which is their territory. And I'll just read from a little bit from their, um, their um, environmental assessment. According to Coast Salish concept of land tenure and territoriality, the water, the land, the air and resources of the Slewatooth territory are our birthright. We have a profound obligation to both our ancestors and future generations to protect and care for our water, land, air and resources. Notice their use of the word land tenure. It's very different from owning land as property. This tenure, the word comes from the French word or verb, tenir, to hold. And it implies a relationship that is reciprocal. Holding land, maybe in trust, and being held by land. Similarly, their use of the word territoriality, to me anyway, it suggests an experienced sense of belonging to place and being embedded in a kinship network of all the beings that share that place and all the obligations that are associated with being part of that kinship network. <clears throat> The assessment, they, they continue and they as their conclusion, <clears throat> they, they write, our obligation is not to oil. Our obligation is to the land. Or no, our obligation is to our land, our water, our people, our life, our snawayat. In other words, our law. According to our law, this project represents a risk that we, the Slail Walters people, are not prepared to take. Period. No more discussion. I think many settlers are resist, a little resistant to taking on this work of reconciliation that I've just been talking about because they're kind of afraid they're gonna lose land as property. But reconciliation invites us all to reconnect with land as something alive 
that holds us and can sustain us as long as we fulfill our responsibilities towards the land. Last thing I want to share, it's, it's become clear to me that these last five years have not only been a learning journey, they've been a healing journey too. Healing a sense of disconnection that has haunted me all my life and that I suspect might go all the way back to my great, great grandparents who settled in Canada in the 1830s. Having been disconnected, displaced from their ancestral homeland in Scotland, when the land there was turned into private property and they were cleared off. But the point I realize now isn't going back to Scotland or wherever. What matters is recovering the ways of thinking and being and doing. The practices of relating to the earth and all the beings that we share it with, with empathy and respect. As the climate crisis closes in on us, Perhaps this reconciliation with the Earth's ways of being are the most, is the most urgent thing we can do. Thank you. Over to you, Ted. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. There's so, there's so many things that are uh, struck home for our audience as well. We've been watching us. We have, have uh, Bridget, who's in Paris, and, and Mary, who's in... Uh, in Aotearoa. So we have people from uh, all across the globe listening to, you know, what you're talking about today. And I know that uh, that connection or disconnection with land and relationships is something that hits home because when we track our, our ancestors and their travels, oftentimes the descendants today are living in a distinctly different place than where their ancestors lived. And one of the things that we know is true is uh, uh, Dudley's ancestors and his family around them have always lived in that spot mm -hmm. forever, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, that deep connection with the land is is a huge chasm, and you felt that while you were there, like you you didn't have that connection with that land that they had, and absolutely, might, yeah, and you might have thought that because your ancestors were close by, they came from Scotland to 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 that treaty territory, so you did have that connection. But it's been my my experience along the way is that it's not even close that 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 deep embedded connection and relationship with land, uh, and the and the people who've lived there forever is is something astounding. Mm -hmm. One of what occurs to me is as we learn to honor that connection and what it means for current public policy, mm -hmm. we're honoring our own ancestors. I, I, all of that sense of connection has been obliterated in my past. I'm not trying to say that I've still got an Indigenous. So, so, but when, when people like Robin Kimmerer talk about becoming Indigenous to place, I think this is part of that kind of healing that can happen as people yeah. realize that they, they somewhere back in their ancestry, there's some people who live directly with the land. Uh, mm -hmm. and possibly in respectful relationships at some point. Uh, but even... To, to, to have that in the back of your imagination gives you a, a common frame for being able to really respect and honor and be in solidarity with uh, this new name here mm -hmm. and Anishinaabe elsewhere, uh, everywhere on Turtle Island, because re achieving justice for them and, and honoring the treaty rights is a way of restoring balance with the earth and in the, on the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you spoke you you spoke well about that balance and that's uh, seeking harmony. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started this path with uh, in the Nanaimalees and the public schools, uh, our our knowledge keepers were cautious at first because they didn't want us to do what we've always done in Western style organizations, which is to uh, take bits and pieces of indigenous knowledge and reshape them into Western thought. Mm -hmm. um, so they've embedded lots of what we're doing in language. So the Siyat Yatsas 
is uh, see uh, yeah, his colleagues and friends. And the Tsas ending is working together. So friends and colleagues working together. And they gave us a, a framework to try to understand what it is we were working on. And it started with land. And the land gives us everything, but we have an obligation. And you mentioned that we have an obligation. It's a reciprocal relationship to give back to that land. And if we do it right, out of that land, the land gives us language, the land gives us culture. And if we pay attention to those three things and nurture them and look after them, then we become healthy as people on this land. And mm -hmm. if we're really patient and if we listen and observe, then out of that finally comes knowledge. Mm -hmm. But it takes time and it takes thought and it takes gentleness and it takes nurturing and it takes that sense of responsibility and obligation to do that. Um, and patience. Well, patience. Patience and humility. Yes. One of the, the great traps that so many people like me get into is we feel we've got to be, we've got to have it all figured out. And we got to have all the answers. No, 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 no. To, to just diminish yourself, get over yourself and just mm -hmm. be a learner, just be a listener. And, and that, that, that humility is, is a very critical part of that thing, which I think helps you to have the patience mm -hmm. to take the time yeah. to, um, to change yourself and change the story. Yeah. Heather, how did you learn to listen? That's a really difficult uh, practice of listening. I think I one of the things I've learned is the importance of having a project with some a real project with with some indigenous people, wherever they are, where you get the opportunity to be in relationship, a real relationship, because it was only in the context of the relationship building that I was challenged and uh, was made to it was up against it, because if I was just looking in the mirror, I could I, it's, it's all seamless. There's no I can't see the cracks. But in the relationships, that's when the contradictions would start to show up. And and I so that's and because I, I you know, this whole thing is the intention, honorable intentions aren't good enough, but it's a good start to have if your intentions are honorable, then you do the work on yourself. So I just it took a while, Steph, for me to learn to shut up. <laughs> I'm still learning. I love that. I have a question for you uh, from the floor. There's a really good one. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly. It, it's Farat. Uh, Farat says, this is such an important book, particularly at a time when the world is so frayed. It is a primer really for us settlers. We want to establish that connection. But where does one start this necessary work? So I just heard you say you start within a project where you become in relationship with and to and from. But do you have any other concrete steps where uh, a settler might might begin? I think if you if sometimes um, sort of studies book clubs can be a setting because people it provides a safe place in which you can share your gaffes because most people have little stories they don't want to necessarily admit to them, but where they put their foot right into it. And so if people share those, then it kind of gets you over thinking, you know, freezing, because so many people are frozen in a sense of embarrassment, guilt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole thing of get over yourself. But the, the, I mean, I can't say enough about the projects that will make a difference, because this is the other thing. We're talking about reconciliation in the day to day life. And the previous uh, speaker in this series, the UMEC, on January 10th, he talked about the importance of place names. So I'm just thinking that schools, communities, groups across the country, that could be a relationship building project where you were to try to take names back to where they came from. Yeah. Um, and Umik gave an example of a, a mountain that its true name um, in his language told a story of how it protects the people. So he talked about how important these place, putting the place names back are to, mm -hmm. to people knowing who they are and where they come from and how they fit into and how they, the relationship they have with the land. And that in itself, that pro project could be, it's a simple one, um, 
but it could be a, an opportunity for a ceremony. So the white people are charged with creating, putting on a feast. And of course, they're going to get it wrong. But <laughs> if they learn, if they put themselves in a position of being students and learning from the, the whoever it is, be it um, 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 Algonquin, um, uh, Anishinaabe, wherever they are, Cree, Dene, uh, across the country, um, that... It, that's when I heard Umi make that point last the, in the last lecture. I thought, now there's a small thing that could be done just about anywhere, um, because having building those relationships, then we can start to go from there. Okay, what else? Hmm. More. Oh, sorry. Thank you for that question, Farhat. Yeah. Um, Oh. Sorry, we've got Bo Wagner here, uh, one of our Coast Salish uh, boat builders. What were you going to say? Oh, I, I just I hear a lot of. Um, it, it sounds like we need to lead with humility. Is what I'm hearing uh, a lot. Um, when we lead with humility, and we uh, let go of our egos in our mind, and we lead with our heart, with our love, with our joy, with our kindness, then we can. Um, approach reconciliation with an open heart, with love, with joy, with kindness, mm -hmm. and truly belong to the land. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you both. Thank you both. That's I've learned so much along those lines. So thank you for affirming that. Yeah, lead with love, with humility, with empathy, empathy, empathy. Um, and uh, and then and then that sense of belonging to the land uh, can just grow because mm. you let it be, you let it you let it grow in you. Thank you. There's a, a question from Greg. Good, good. You say that, but before you do, I want to just mention uh, Carrie Kilmartin at UBC Press. I hope you saw that discount code so you can purchase uh, Heather's book. Should you want to read it? or take it out from the library. We've got quite a few libraries that are uh, on board in British Columbia. If you're here in British Columbia, let's go to the website. Thanks. Oh, Dave. and the other thing is, if I, I forget what, what minimum dollar amount it is where you get the free shipment, but if there's a few of you watching, <laughs> you, you can coalesce and then you, then you, then Carrie will send these books free. <laughs> Uh, Greg, I like your question because I've been in most of my career, well, most of my career in, ed in education and elementary education, so have been guided along the way by really smart women for the most part. So I like your question here. I noticed that most attendees here are women. Just wondering, Heather, if you have seen on both First Nation and settler sides different roles in the reconciliation process for men and women. And then it says, uh, I guess my, how do you say that, Greg? I guess my real question is, what's the role for men in this process? I, I'm, one of the things I loved about beginning to learn uh, the Anishinaabe language is that it does not have gender protein. It doesn't have male, female. It's got animate or inanimate. And what I find is that the people who show up are the people who show up. And um, uh, and it could be that the conditioning that people who uh, end up identifying as men have received over the years has put them so much into a position of being self-conscious of being, you know, having to be the man uh, that that inhibits their ability but if they just see themselves as animate and that let their spirit move them, then they show up too. Uh, I have over, like I, when I was on the launch tour across the country, in fact, it was men who organized a lot of these, the speaking events that I, that I did. Um, so I'm not trying to diminish this. I'm mostly trying to, to say that, that if gender is an issue, don't let that, that inhibit you be it be a human being first animate and animated <laughs> uh, greg from my own experience i'm i'm not from this territory that i've lived on for over the last 50 years 
but along the way, uh, people, uh, mostly Coast Salish uh, women, because they were language speakers, have shared that, that language with me and that knowledge with me along the way. So I feel an obligation because they've given me a window into a whole different way of understanding mm. the world. So I, I feel an obligation to use whatever role that I'm in to uh, highlight and promote and support and, and protect Indigenous language learning. And mm -hmm. in most cases, halt to meet them, uh, just mm -hmm. because I think that within that language is a way to understand the world that could save humanity. So I I yeah. I, I want to make time to to learn uh, Hokumikim if I can myself because um, I mean my ancestral language would be Gaelic but I I, I think I'm better off um, choosing this and pursuing this language because yes you enter the you enter the language and you are instantly into a storied way of seeing the world is that's when you begin to appreciate the world view just soaks right into you and um, it's it's not an intellectual thing it's heart and spirit as Bo says that's the place where we change Heather in your book you uh, for, for a small part of it and you shared it in your uh, talk today there's the United Church and their uh, photographs of the kids who were at residential school and you didn't go deeply into it and I'm looking we've got about nine minutes left and so one of the questions in here from Natalia is what is the role of the church mm. I think it's pursuing uh some good work right now um right now some of the United individual churches that are run by Indigenous people are wanting to create their own organizational structure. And I hope that United Churches across the country generally support that um, because they need their own space in order to articulate what does it mean to move forward in their own in their own particular ways. Um, but a lot of a lot of the right relations groups in United Churches um, that are still going uh, all these years after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission reported are going because they have managed to move themselves beyond talk to actually relationship building with local indigenous communities. And they are doing work to, to support what those communities need. So they are providing skills and they're prov and generally solidarity. They're working in solidarity with them. They're not trying to help them. They're trying to to be walk beside in a way that is supportive. And I, I think that that's the best way for the United Churches to keep going. Um, um, and it's interesting because United Churches actually hosted some of the events that I talked to, uh, when I talked to about my book. And it was the, the guy, Reverend Jamie Scott, who represented United Church of Canada at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he actually wrote a um, a very nice endorsement on the back of the book. So I think that kind of helped people realize, okay, United Churches, maybe you've got a particular reason to to take on this book. But I'm not trying to say that all the United Churches could should get copies, mind you. If you do, that's fine. Um, <laughs> so I hope that I hope that helps to answer the question. Uh, the big thing is to, to think about institutions needing to change and shift from being focused on rules and abstract principles to being more relational. So it also means less it like focused on the future and the past or and more focused on the present because the present is always the evolution of the past towards the future. But it's the more you, you you're, you're able to keep things focused in the present and how are we negotiating and in dialogue, how we're doing things, I think that that is truer to being doing because that's what I'm talking about incorporating these two different ways of thinking and doing things and being um, and I think it means transforming how you do curriculum at schools and universities it, it it means shifting from a focus on textbooks to other things as texts right? uh, this woman this young woman I was talking about in the book Bonnie's granddaughter uh, she was. She did her master's degree, and, and she had this revelation one day when she was at her grandmother's place because her great grandmother had made sun hats out of tiny splints of of um, black ash wood, 
woven them into sun hats and um, had sold these to tourists as a way to kind of help make ends meet. And uh, here was this just sort of sitting, hanging on a wall. And she one day just took it and said, OK, I'm going to focus on this. All the relationships around the making of that and um, what that and just outward from there. And so that kind of shift uh, in focus. And I remember there was, a, um, I think she's, she's West Coast. Uh, not to link it, uh, to Watton. Um, her she's an artist called Janine Fry, and in her master's thesis, getting a, a master's in or in fine arts, she talked about bush theory, mm. and I that phrase has stayed with me, and I'm so grateful for it, and and it shows you why it's so important to have, for instance, a did Chinta Center in the Northwest Territories where. It is land-based learning, and as Leanne Betamosaki Simpson calls it, land as pedagogy. So these kind of shifts are what these are the institutional changes, cult, and particularly here, just in the cultural sector, that are going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that, Heather. Each of our organizations, right? Uh, individuals within that organization. If we start to think differently, then we start to walk differently, and then things start to ripple out from that. Mm -hmm. We were together two weeks ago at uh, Wildwood mm -hmm. with Umik and uh, our great friend Nancy Turner gifted Umik with, a, with a, a walking stick. And on the walking stick, there was a word engraved on it. And uh, I hope I do it justice. Uh, Tlasmap. Tlasmap. Uh, a Nuchanos word meaning medicine that you put on. And I thought that's a, such a beautiful word. Uh, and embedded in that word and it is so much of a different way of viewing the world. And so I want to uh, uh, finish off here and raise my hands uh, to you, uh, you for giving us some medicine that we can put on with your, uh, with your book about meeting my treaty kin and also doing such honor to the people who shared that pain, that understanding, that knowledge with you mm -hmm. while you were there, and probably continue to do that because now you're in a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so again, so thank you for that, that class map uh, giving us Can that. Can I message. just say one little thing because you you on, you lifted up these, these people that I worked with. Uh, mm -hmm. And since it's on your screen, um, you can see me, the, the Shaganosh in the picture on, that's included on the cover, but to the immediate left, that's Kevin Simon. And mm -hmm. then the woman with, the, she did not take her baseball cap off, that's Cully. Mm -hmm. And the other woman is Lacey, who is Kevin's uh, wife. Mm -hmm. So I just, I thought I'd grab that moment. I am so full of gratitude that they had the patience to work with me, to 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 give me the space to grow up, to learn, to listen, uh, and the enormous trust uh, that they had that they put in me to help to bring their story into uh, the form of a published book. Um, and it and it a lot of there's a lot of people like me, white people, who are afraid to get involved. But again, I think for good reason because. There's all this cultural appropriation stuff, and we never even got into that. But I take that on in the book. Um, there's no two ways about it, as Jesse Wente said of, of the, you know, that, that in Inuk movie, um, The Fast Runner, that's what it says in English. He describes that as a truly inside job because it was entirely made by Inuk filmmakers and the cast, the crew, everything. The long struggle for home unfortunately is not an inside job because my being involved, but they were very, very grateful that their story was told for the first time. And um, nothing is perfect. It's reconciliation is messy. Um, I got involved, I made mistakes. I had egg on my face. I fell flat on my face, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But still I am here learning and listening, learning to listen. And um, so yeah, reconciliation is messy, but if we get on with it, we'll we'll achieve something together. Life, life is messy like that. So thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you mm -hmm. next time. See you in two Stay weeks. With. Yeah. See you with.